right, all right. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the first and foremost we wanna do is welcome you and thank you so, so much for joining us today for our first advocacy training session. Um, this could not be made possible without um, the African American Cultural Resource Center, um, as well as um, the Center of Community Engagement, as well as student activities, um, leadership, as well as engagement. We've been working on this for a while now. Um, I, I wanna say it's since November. So we're really excited for everybody to be here today your feedback and to know more about how we can expand this. Um, this program is designed to explore the areas of inequalities um, and to examine how we as advocates can impact on a forever changing and evolving world. Um, as you can see, the facilitators today are spectacular. We have Eric Watford um, from the AACRC, as well as Keith Lancer, um, Brittany uh, Goodrum, as well as myself, um, Sophia Bazell. Um, I want to go over just a few technical uh, protocols before we turn it over to our facilitators just to make sure that everything is running smoothly. As you can see, we have 86 people and possibly growing on this call right now. So we want to make sure that everybody has a really great experience and are able to engage um, with us um, in this high capacity. Um, so first and foremost, we are joined by uh, Dr. Evans. She is the Associate Director of Community Engagement and Operations. Um, she will actually help us navigate um, this space and a little bit more on um, those who want to have an individual conversation with her, particularly if something is really moving during what we're talking about and you just space to talk to a mental health professional. Um, Dr. Evans, I will, I do want to turn this over to you just to introduce yourself and introduce a little bit about what CAPS is and the resources are available. Sure, so good afternoon or good morning everyone. I hope you all had a great uh, Martin Luther King Day yesterday and I just want to share a little bit about our services um, very briefly and to start with um, we offer 24 seven crises um, services. So um, even if it's not during our business hours, you can still call our phone number um, at 513-556-0648. And we will make sure that you are able to speak with the counselor. Um, and then we also um, provide a variety of different services. And how you get started with our services is through what's called a rapid access consultation appointment or a RAC appointment for short. And then um, with there, you would meet with the counselor one-on-one -on -one to discuss your needs and any potential services that we have available. Um, and to go over some of the services, we would provide a brief individual counseling as well as group counseling as well too, which I'll share more about that in a moment. Um, and we understand that sometimes students might have needs that, um, ex that exceed uh, the services that we provide and that's okay. Um, we provide uh, referrals as well too. So if you wanted to see a provider in the community, we'd be happy to help uh, provide resources for that. And then also, um, in addition to that, I do want to uh, go back to our group counseling. Um, so we have two different types of groups. We have what are called um, therapy groups. And in those, you would need to be a client of ours um, and go through, as I mentioned, the RAC process before that. Um, but then those are, are groups where you would be able to um, connect with other students who may be experiencing similar um, challenges as you and to get some additional support there. Um, and it's run by one or two providers. And then what we also have community wellness groups and those are groups where we partner with another, typically partner with another office or department. Um, those are more drop-in support groups um, that students would be able to come to. They don't need to be a client of ours um, for those and um, and what's great about all of our group services is that they're all free. Um, and as well as our rapid access consultation appointments are free as well too. And our services are available for all students. Um, and we also provide let's talk sessions as well too. And those are brief 15 minute consultations where you would meet one-on-one -on -one, um, with the counselor. 
And then I also uh, lastly just want to highlight um, that we provide outreach services as well too, much like what we'll be doing today. Um, we provide presentations, we could serve as a panelist, um, just a variety of, of different activities that we do. Um, and then also, if you're interested in our services, like I said, you can give us a call and then um, we, will, we will get you scheduled, get you connected. Um, and if you would like to follow us on social media, then our handle on Twitter and Instagram is uh, UC underscore caps. Uh, so please be sure to follow us. Um, and just want to thank you for the opportunity to share a bit about our services. And if you have any questions, please, please don't, have, don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you. Or visit our website as well, which is, which is located on this slide. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. And, and as you may have seen um, in the group chat, we did drop a link so that if anybody during this session does feel or does need to talk to Dr. Evans, um, we want you to please um, navigate your own feelings and please make that space to talk to Dr. Evans about what you're experiencing and make a plan with her. Um, and then join back with us whenever you get a chance to. But Dr. Evans is a wonderful resource and we want to make sure that we are um, definitely giving you that space. And again, thank you so much for joining us um, today. Um, so uh, one thing, again, like I said, the link is there, but if you do need to talk um, to her later on um, without the, the, and you can't find the link, please message one of us. We will send you that link. Um, and then, of course, it will be in Teams. Um, one other thing, we want this to be an engaging experience. And again, there's 89 of you, which is fantastic, but only four or five of us. So with that said, um, please Please, please be gracious with us. Put your questions in the chat. Um, if you have, we have um, throughout the whole entire program certain um, areas where you can ask questions, and then I will moderate that or give those to our um, facilitators. But also, if you are like, hey, I want to make my comment like through my mouth, not yours, Cerulea, that is fine. Um, all I need you to do is just push the reaction button, uh, raise hands, and then we'll write down your name so it can be in order, and then we'll let the facilitator know, hey, so-and-so has a question, and then you two can engage and keep us all in, um, and, and all of us engaged at the same time. Um, so that is actually all I have for you today. Um, you should have had an email that also has the, um, the programming uh, pamphlet um, in there as well. If you do not have that, we will also put that in the chat in a few minutes um, while Keith is going over the objectives. But again, we're so happy to um, have you today and thank you so much for your commitment to our community. So with that said, Keith, please take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. So I'm Keith Lancer, Assistant Director of the Center for Community Engagement, and we're going to begin today's training by covering some objectives. So our overall goal for today's training is for you to be able to define advocacy, allyship, diversity, forms of suppression and oppression, and the tenets of racial fatigue. Um, you will also discuss experiences of advocacy or oppression and learn more about their intersection, intersectionality and the intersection, intersecting identities of others. And you will develop an action plan on making the campus community and beyond more inclusive while learning what your roles are, uh, how to protect your mental health, and how to recognize signs of racial fat fatigue. Before we, we begin the content of the training, it's going to be important for us to cover some ground rules. So um, these ground rules are kind of principles that we're going to be, um, you know, working off of uh, during this training. So I have nine ground rules that I'm going to cover, and then I'm going to provide an opportunity for you all um, to add additional ground rules if you would like. So uh, the first ground rule is be honest and respectful. Okay, be careful not to make assumptions about or for other people. Speak from your own experience. Do not speak for others. Use language like in my experience as opposed to I heard that they. Listen to understand 
and listen harder when you hold a different view. It is okay to disagree, but do so with curiosity and not hostility or animosity. Be brief and concise so everyone has an opportunity to participate today. Please keep everyone's views confidential. Please do not gossip about other people's viewpoints after this training is over. Don't judge someone for their opinion. We're all here in good faith. Practice civil behavior. Refrain from interrupting or using a loud voice or angry tone. And don't give advice or try to fix others. Everyone's perfect just how they are. So now I want to throw it all to you um, and give you an opportunity to add additional ground rules if you'd like. So this is kind of a mini break. Uh, so it's an opportunity if you need to, to run to the restroom or grab a quick snack or a, a cup of coffee before we begin the content of today's training. Uh, or I want you to throw in, into the chat um, ideas of other ground rules that you think we should adhere to today. So I'm going to um, let you all do that, give you a, maybe a minute or two, and we'll check the chat to see if you have additional ground rule ideas. Any other thoughts on additional ground rules? So I'll go, go back so you can review them one more time. So again, we said the ground rules are be honest and respectful, speak from your own experience, listen to understand. It is okay to disagree, but do so with curiosity be brief and concise so everyone has an opportunity to participate. Please keep everyone's views confidential. Don't judge someone for their opinion. Practice civil behavior and don't give advice or try to fix others. Great, Amy in the chat um, posted not, not ground rules, uh, but a resource created by my library colleague, uh, Michaela Cord Corday, and good resource right there. Okay, someone in the chat says the list seems to be complete. Well, good, perfect. So we'll leave those ground rules. Um, and so we're going to talk very quickly about the difference between safe spaces and brave, brave spaces. So, you know, I want you to reflect on your own. You know, how many of you have heard of these terms before, safe spaces and brave spaces? I bet quite a few have heard of those terms before. Uh, Sorelia, I, can you let me know how to turn off notifications? I'm not sure how to do that. Um, I don't think we'll be able to do it right now, but just whenever you see, um, like, I'll just ping you whenever there's a box and just okay. ask you to uh, close out. Those. Okay, cool. So when we talk about brave spaces, or safe spaces, excuse me. Uh, a safe space doesn't spur judgment based on identity or experience. You know, both can exist and be affirmed without fear or repercussion and without the pressure uh, to educate. So while learning may occur in safe spaces, the priority is really to provide support. And so a brave space, on the other hand, inspires dialogue and conversation. Right, brave spaces recognize difference and hold each person accountable to do the work of sharing experiences and coming to new understandings. Okay, something that is often difficult and uncomfortable. So today's advocacy training is a brave space and not a safe space. So you may feel uncomfortable today and you might feel a little exhausted by the end of today's training. Uh, we just want you to know that that is okay and completely normal, and that's why uh, we have Dr. Evans here and our friends from CAPS, because we want you um, to, to be able to work through your feelings. 
So any questions about the difference between a safe space and a brave space before we continue uh, with the rest of our content for today? Great. All right, Brittany, you wanna take it from here? Yes, thank you, Keith. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Goodrum, and I work in Student Affairs with Leadership and Engagement. Um, so kind of like he said, um, if at any point during the conversation uh, you get overwhelmed, feel free to, you know, step away. Um, the counselor is available uh, for support. Um, these conversations can be hard and uncomfortable, and we totally understand that, um, but we want to have productive conversation. And I know it can, these conversations are a little tricky because you don't want to be perceived the wrong way. Um, but just open and honest opinions is really what we're striving uh, to get here. All righty, let's discuss racism. So next slide. Okay, um, so we're gonna just start our foundation with defining racism. Uh, so we're gonna use the definition of the systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another. Okay, so that looks like the gap in education, housing, um, wealth and employment, government surveillance and violence, arrest and incarceration, mortality, and drug arrests. So we will dive deeper into those, but that's kind of what we're gonna use as our foundation for defining racism. Okay, so here's a quick question for you guys. Can marginalized people, um, people of color, black, Hispanic, Native American, be racist? So if you guys can do the poll for us, that would be awesome. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people think that, yes, people of color can be racist. Um, so let's dive into that. So there's racial prejudice and there's race, racism, which as using the definition that we uh, started with is the system of advantages based on race. Um, so if we're talking about racial prejudice, then people of color absolutely can and do have racial prejudices, but people of color do not um, systematically benefit from racism. There's not a system of advantage for people of color. So that answer would be no. Um, there's no systematic cultural and institutional support uh, or sanction for the racial bigotry of people of color. So that can be, right, uh, a tricky question because if we use it as, right, like we said, systematically, people of color do not benefit from racism, but we can have racial prejudices. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna get into uh, Jeopardies, which was coined by Francis Beale in 1970. So Jeopardies are additional barriers and burdens faced by individuals uh, who hold multiple disadvantaged uh, statuses, right? So it could be racism, uh, a black person or Hispanic person is disadvantaged. And then on top of that, you can have a double jeopardy, uh, sexism. So maybe an African-American female, uh, classism, right? Your status, uh, lower, upper, middle class, um, and heteronormative. Uh, LGBTQ, all of those things can, um, you know, affect the way your interactions with people are handled and just kind of how you experience the world in and of itself. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about forms of oppression, uh, school segregation. So Brown v. Board of Education. Um, most of us probably know what that is, uh, racial segregation in schools and it banded 
racial segregation in schools um, and deemed it as unconstitutional, um, but also no child left behind. How do, do, a lot of, do you know what no child left behind is? Are we familiar with that term? You can put it in the chat or... Okay, good. So for the people who don't know, um, no Child Left Behind um, requires uh, standardized testing, um, an emphasis on math and reading, but it has been uh, kind of counterproductive in some ways because it's narrowed the uh, curriculum and um, it has forced teachers to spend less time on other subjects outside of math and reading. Um, just to focus on passing the standard, the students, yes, passing the um, standardized test for math and reading and not focusing on social studies or the arts and things of that nature. Um, so it doesn't really equip students for higher education and whatnot. So we can also, we don't talk about redlining. Um, and how that has affected school funding um, and mandates and stuff like that. So redlining is when the federal government would literally draw a red line on maps um, to show what areas they would not invest in uh, based off demographics alone. Um, and it was also used to prevent minority groups from purchasing homes and properties in other neighborhoods, but we'll talk about that in a little while. And next slide. Okay, forms of oppression, critical race theory, and whitewashing. Um, so there are many critical theories to fit all uh, fit with all marginalized groups. Uh, whitewashing is defined as the act of glossing over and covering up vices, crimes, or scandals, or exonerating by means of perfunctory investigation or biased presentation of data. Um, so who can give us an example of that? You can put in the chat if you would like to speak up. Thanksgiving, yep. History books, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so a big one that comes to mind um, for me, I came from Georgia State University. Um, and of course we all know about the Ahmaud Arbery case um, where you know, the people who murdered him probably wouldn't have been brought to justice had there not been a video because the, um, the DA kind of swept it under the rug. Um, so that is definitely covering up a crime and people benefiting from, um, you know, their status and what they look like. Um, the slogan, all lives matter, that's a good one. I'm seeing a lot of good things in the chat. Um, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, the history books, how, you know, we're taught about, um, you know, how things played out historically, um, you know, Christopher Columbus, MLK quotes that are posted on uh, social media. Um, I know a big one when the riots were going on, um, you know, a lot of people were saying like Dr. King didn't want um, people to riot, it doesn't help anything. But he also said that uh, violence is the voice of those unheard, right? So when we continuously ignore people and their, their issues and their struggles and what's happening to them, um, that violence does, you know, is what happens next. Okay. All right, so now we have a short clip. Been plagued by gun violence and drug crime. My life in my legal career changed the first day of that internship. I walked into a courtroom and I saw an auditorium of people who one by one would approach the front of that courtroom to say two words and two words only, not guilty they were predominantly black and brown. 
And then a judge, a defense attorney, and a prosecutor would make life-altering decisions about that person without their input. They were predominantly white. As each person, one by one, approached the front of that courtroom, I couldn't stop but think, how did they get here? I wanted to know their stories. And as the prosecutor read the facts of each case, I was thinking to myself, we could have predicted that. That seems so preventable. Not because I was an expert in criminal law, but because it was common sense. Over the course of the internship, I began to recognize people in the auditorium, not because they were criminal masterminds, but because they were coming to us for help and we were sending them out without any. My second year of law school, I worked as a paralegal for a defense attorney, and in that experience, I met many young men accused of murder. Even in our worst, I saw human stories. And they all contained childhood trauma, victimization, poverty, loss, disengagement from school, early interaction with the police and the criminal justice system, all leading to a seat in a courtroom. Those convicted of murder were condemned to die in prison, and it was during those meetings with those men that I couldn't fathom why we would spend so much money to keep this one person in jail for the next 80 years when we could have reinvested it up front and perhaps prevented the whole thing from happening in the first place. My third year of law school, I defended people accused of small street crimes, mostly mentally ill, mostly homeless, mostly drug addicted, all in need of help. They would come to us and we would send them away without that help. They were in need of our assistance, but we weren't giving them any. Prosecuted, adjudged, and defended by people who knew nothing about them. The staggering inefficiency is what drove me to criminal justice work. The unfairness of it all made me want to be a defender. The power dynamic that I came to understand made me become a prosecutor. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the problem. We know that the criminal justice system needs reform. We know that there are 2.3 million people in American jails and prisons, making us the most incarcerated nation on the planet. We know that there's another 7 million people on probation or parole. We know that the criminal justice system disproportionately affects people of color, particularly poor people of color. And we know that there are system failures happening everywhere. Thanks so much, Keith. Okay, so that was Adam Foss. He's a prosecutor um, who talks about, you know, further on in the video, talks about how his life changed when he realized, um, you know, just how intricate the criminal justice system is and how it is disproportionately set up for people to fail and for people to reoffend. Um, so we're going to talk about that in the next few slides. Okay. Let's talk about what we learned from the video. You can put any questions or comments you have in the message box. Brittany, I have a comment. Um, sure. Maybe that will will get things going because I, I see. Oh, Rebecca has a really great um, uh, comment as well. Um, it's it's very interesting when we're thinking about um, the areas that we're in and the experiences that we have. Like for I, for example, have um, a couple of brothers who actually have passed away due to being in the system and neglect as well as the drug overdoses. And of course, um, that is a familiar story. I think many people. Of, um, of color or from marginalized institutions at least know somebody who has been exposed to the system and has um, really um, had a different story than those who are from the dominant um, society or the white society. So um, 
how, what, what did this, what, how does reaction feel for you? Like, what does this video say to you for your own identity? Um, we see that there's so many comments where it says, um, a lot of people said that there's nothing new about this and the social justice system is definitely broken, but what are your thoughts um, when we're thinking about our advocacy training around this? Sure. So I, you know, especially watching that video, he talks about, um, you know, if all of these things could have been prevented, right? If we reinvested the money up front, instead of spending the money to send them to prison for 80 years, um, you know, we as a society would be better off. Um, and that comes from, like we talked about earlier, um, the education, right? I heard, I saw um, some comments in the chat uh, saying, you know, lack of representation, um, but if students who are growing up in poor communities because of the lack of funding provided by the government because of redlining, um, because of you know, lower standardized testing scores, um, where instead of getting less money because they're not doing as well, they should be getting more money to bring them up to where they need to be, um, right? So we have these students who are not getting a solid foundation in school um, because they don't have good resources, you know, highly qualified teachers, books, computers, laptops that they need. So then when they do, even when they do decide that they would like to go to college um, to be a lawyer, a judge, um, you know, they are severely lacking in, you know, the fundamentals. And it's, it's really hard to get pulled up to speed um, your first day in a college course. You know, college, as we all know, is a beast. Um, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot of uh, different things educational wise. Um, so if you're still trying to build on a foundation because you have a really weak foundation, it's almost impossible, right? And this was done by design. This wasn't an accident. It's almost impossible to be those politicians, those lawyers, those attorneys um, to try the cases, to decide how we're going to prosecute a case, if we're going to prosecute a case, um, and give these people another shot at life, right? I venture to say we've all made mistakes in life, and that's kind of how I feel. Uh, we've all made mistakes in life, but for some people, those mistakes led in arrest, and other people, those, those mistakes led to a slap on a hand, um, and we really need to get, you know, on one level playing field. Um, racial surveillance, uh, people of color are largely over-policed, right? It's not that people of color commit more crimes, right? The data shows that that's actually not true, but if you're over police, then you are more likely to get caught um, in your offenses and uh, punished for that. So that's kind of my take on it. I see some really good comments um, in the chat. The myth of colorblindness versus the reality. Yes, that was a big, um, a big favorite of uh, colorblindness, right? I don't see color. But we know that that's not true. And we know that especially people of color are right plagued with it. We can't, it's not something that we could turn a blind eye to because it affects everyday life. Anyone else? Let's see. Another comment that was made um, by Amy, she said that I found that she found the comment about not knowing the defendants interesting. How do we, and her question was, how do we do this? Sure. Well, that's kind of a, that's a good question. That's a hard question. Um, because especially public defenders are so overwhelmed in their caseloads. It's, it's almost impossible to get to know every single one of your clients at that point when you're a public defender and you have these people assigned to you. Um, you know, it's actually interesting. So my brother was a state trooper uh, here in Ohio, and he actually is in law school now because he saw so many injustices in the courtroom and he saw so many um, defenders who were, um, you know, reading over their case 15, 20 minutes before trial, not knowing, you know, anything about this person that they were going for. And it was heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. Um, so that comes from, uh, I guess the only way to combat that is to get more people into these positions. Um, so defendants or uh, the prosecutors, the attorneys aren't so uh, saturated with cases and overwhelmed to really give them uh, a fighting chance. Because as we know, you know, 
money can buy you a lot of things, especially in the criminal justice world. You know, we talk about bond and bail. Um, a lot of people sit in jail just because they can't post bond. Maybe three years later, they, the charges are all dropped um, because it doesn't go to trial. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at there, getting more people into these seats, into these, you know, trainings, into these classes and doing our part um, to provide that. There's a lot of really good like bail relief funds, um, which we can probably put that in the chat at some point um, where people can donate to these bail relief funds and get people out of jail who are sitting there waiting on trial. Um, Uh, one more thing that I would like to add, um, uh, I'm breaking my own rule, I do apologize, but uh, when it comes to um, particularly knowing the individual, we're talking about the counter narratives that everybody has. We all have our own stories, our own backgrounds, and disparities that follow us um, are individually, you know, they're individually unique. And that means that when um, a representative might see a Black boy, um, the first thing they might think of are the stereotypes as opposed to actually understanding the stories or the disparities that are actually impacting their, um, their actual actions or, you know, how their family grow up. Um, what was the economic status of that? Um, you know, what kind of community they broke up in? How was that school? Um, and there's so many different things to, to go back on. But when you're thinking about um, who you're defending, um, it, it really is, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. You have to read the book. We are our own individual authors. And that means knowing um, who we are, what impacted us and actually standing up for us as opposed to standing against the stereotype. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Anyone else? Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about oppression in um, society, right? So the first thing on our list, we have job and resume discrimination. Um, so in America, we know that um, an African-American male with a college education is less likely to get a job over a white male with a high school um, diploma or even a GED. Um, talking about job and resume discrimination, uh, names, there's a lot of discrimination in um, you know, just your name, right? So getting a job, uh, trying to do better for yourself, but if you're not getting hired because you have a, unique name or something like that. Um, you know, there's definitely discrimination there. We also talk about, um, right, when you do, if and when you do get an interview, how should your hair be? We're just starting to unpack this, um, you know, notion that, um, you know, natural hair, African-Americans natural hair is professional, right? For so long, it was kind of taught that you should have straight hair for an interview. You should, you know, not have dreadlocks or your natural curly hair wasn't acceptable um, because that would make you less likely to get a job. Um, the housing discrimination, we talked earlier about redlining and how people in poor communities are less likely to get home loans. And if they do, it would be at a higher interest rate or higher payments. There's also, um, you know, houses that have photos of a black family in the home are being appraised significantly undervalued um, than what they would be and what they are if there are either no photos or photos of a white family in the home. Um, so that's definitely something that people of color are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Also your last name, um, you know, Ramirez, Johnson, those kind of last names have worked against people trying to get houses, even if they can't afford them just because of that discrimination. Um, law and order, we kind of talked about that um, with Adam Foss, right? This notion that, oh, if you break the rules, you should be punished for it. Um, but if people of color, marginalized people are over-policed, um, then that's not getting the job done. And also mandatory minimums, um, and really like harsher sentencing for people of color. Um, 
So I know we talked about how can we, right? How can we combat this? And a lot of people, um, you know, the answer should be to vote, right? Vote for your judges, your legislators, um, your politicians, your president. Um, but we have this gerrymandering, which makes it harder for people, um, people of color specifically to, um, to vote because of, um, right? When we're allowed to vote, I know there's a crackdown now on mail-in voting because of how impactful it was on the last presidential election with the mail-in um, ballots. Um, I saw in the chat uh, earlier, someone said the war on drugs versus the opioid ep epidemic, right? So the war on drugs is largely faced towards marijuana um, and people who are African-American or you know marginalized and they have mandatory minimums, harsher sentences. But when things like heroin were hitting the streets, um, and that largely affected, um, you know, the majority of white people, we called that the opioid epidemic and that those people needed help, whereas the war on drugs, as it related to, you know, black people, crack cocaine, marijuana, was that these people are, are bad, they're criminals, and they should be sent away for, at minimum, this amount of time, and they weren't getting the, the rehabs and the resources that they needed um, to overcome you know, what they needed help with. Um, yes, so the disproportionate sen sentencing for crack versus powder cocaine. So crack cocaine is a schedule one drug, which is the worst of the worst. Um, you know, you're gonna get the book thrown at you if you get caught with, you know, a small amount of crack cocaine versus uh, powder cocaine, which is a more concentrated version of crack cocaine. Um, but crack powder cocaine is a schedule two drug and you're going to get less of a sentence, um, for having powder cocaine on you, which is most, um, you know, used mostly by upper class, uh, white men where crack cocaine was seen to be more used by African-American communities. So that's not by mistake, of course. Um, so that was a good comment, Rebecca. Thank you for that. Okay. Hey, next slide. Okay. It is time to take a break. I know that was a lot of information um, thrown at everyone. So how about a quick 10 minute break? Um, just kind of cool off. Anything you want to say, you can put that in the chat too. And we can dive into that when we come back from our break.
Right. Hope everyone had a good little break. Hope you are 
relaxed and ready for the second half of today's training. <clears throat> so why don't we get started? So the next segment of our presentation is on our roles, our responsibility, how to be an advocate. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run you through the um, 10 steps of advocacy planning that is prepared by the National Council for the Social Studies. And so this is a fairly easy 10 step action plan. And so it might be a good idea for you to kind of take notes uh, while we're discussing this. And so I'm going to give you, you know, a little bit of time, maybe 30 seconds or so after I discuss each step for you to do a little bit of brainstorming along the way. And then we'll have a little activity uh, once we're finished this, uh, talking about the 10 steps of advocacy planning. So the first step to advocacy planning is identifying an advocacy opportunity, right? So what is the need that you hope to address via your advocacy plan? Is it an an on-campus opportunity? Is it an off-campus opportunity, right? Is this meant to serve um, Cincinnati, right? Is it meant to serve the region, our country, right? What, what issues really keep you up at night, right? Is it, you know, campus sexual assault, childhood poverty, climate change, hunger, right? Healthcare access, reproductive rights, right? Gender equity, the list goes on and on, right? So really think about, you know, what issue do you care about? Uh, and what's an issue that you would actually, you know, feel motivated to do something, right? To change um, the status of whatever that need is. So I'm gonna go through kind of two examples throughout these uh, 10 steps of advocacy planning. So my first example is uh, to increase black student enrollment in UC's electrical engineering program. So uh, for each step, I'll kind of show you, you know, potential ideas under that particular need. And then the second example that we'll talk about um, in the 10, 10 steps of advocacy training is to increase voting rates among black young adults ages 18 to 30 in Cincinnati. So I have both an on-campus example and an off-campus example. All right, so I want to give you um, 30 seconds or so to just jot down some opportunities and some community needs that you find to be really, really important. Okay, so I'm going to give you some time um, to do that brainstorming on your own. So you're brainstorming needs, you're brainstorming things that keep you up at night, right? What do you really care about? What issues have been um, piquing your interest lately? Is it something you noticed going on in your classes? Is it something you noticed going on in your neighborhood? Um, is it something going on nationally? Is it a global issue? Right, so we're thinking about advocacy opportunities. Give you about 10 more seconds. Right. Can be almost anything, environmental issues, income inequality, vaccines. So that's the first step in advocacy planning is really focusing and, and identifying that opportunity. So let's go to the second step. The second step to advocacy planning is determining your key audiences, right? So who is your key audience? Who or what are you hoping to persuade? Why do they need to be persuaded, right? So this really depends on the issue that you identified, right? Do you need to persuade city council? Do you need to persuade local media to do something? Do you need to persuade the governor to uh, sign off on a new law? Is it UC administration? Do you need to persuade other young people 
right? Do you need to persuade the president of the United States, right? All kinds of different audiences that you're probably going to need to persuade to get on board with your advocacy plan, right? So um, the examples um, could be for the first example, the electrical in engineering opportunity. Um, key audiences might be incoming black first year students and their families, right? It might be electrical engineering faculty, and it might be college recruiters, right? These are the folks that um, kind of need to get on the same page in order to increase that enrollment, right, in electrical engineering for underrepresented students. For this second example, right, um, voting for young people in Cincinnati, uh, the key audiences would probably be Black Cincinnatians, ages 18 to 30, and their parents, right? There might be some other audiences as well. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about the audiences that need to be engaged in your advocacy plan in order for you to move the needle a little bit on whatever issue you identified. So you have about 45 seconds. Do you need to convince really religious leaders to get on the same page? Maybe it's state representatives, state senators. Um, maybe it's your federal representatives or your federal senators. Would it be people you work with, coworkers, colleagues, right? Parents, we mentioned that as an under our second example. About 10 more seconds. Okay, so that was step number two, determining key audiences. Step number three, find out what the key audiences already know or perceive about this issue. Um, so, you know, let's go through these examples again. The for under the example of black enrollment in electrical engineering, um, maybe you need to review internal and external student surveys, right, from prospective freshmen or from students who are already in electrical engineering. Um, program. This might require you to create some surveys and send them out, right? Um, but, you know, this could be a strategy to help you learn what, what these folks already think about this issue. Maybe you go to publicly available enrollment data from the United States Department of Education. I know college scorecards are really useful. Uh, the Department of Education um, manages all kinds of um, student enrollment data in aggregate. So that could be another good source of information to kind of figure out um, what kind of drives um, Black young people to matriculate in a certain program. Second example, right, Black young adults voting in Cincinnati. Maybe you should review voting and registration data from the U.S. Census Bureau, right? There's a lot of publicly available data on voting. You could look at research by the Center for Information and Research on civic learning and engagement. That might be a good source of information on voting trends for Black young adults, right? So um, think about, you know, what would the various sources of information be, right, that will give you information on what your key audiences already know or believe about your advocacy opportunity. So, you know, do you need to look at federal voting records? Do you need to look at magazine information? Do you need to look at social media, right, information? What's going on on TV, right? So I'm going to give you a minute to really think about um, this third step, right? What are the different kinds of information? What kind of information do you need to help you um, figure out what your uh, key audiences already know or believe about this particular issue. Got about 30 seconds left.
Do you need to go to library archives? Do you need to do some interviews with folks, right? Do you want to get some qualitative data? Do you need to, you know, go to the internet and look at some content that might be available there? What, what about newspaper coverage? Maybe you can see, you know, how your target audiences view uh, their, their various views via articles and newspapers. Okay, so that was step number three, finding out what your key audiences already know or perceive. So now we're going to go to step four. So we need to determine how each audience currently receives information, right? So if you're trying to persuade your key audiences to believe or um, to believe something in particular or change behavior, right? You need to know, you know, how are they currently digesting information, right? So what would be the best way to communicate with your target audiences and how do they prefer to communicate? So for our electrical engineering example, you know, maybe, you know, if we're, if we're talking about enrollment for black youth, Right. You might want to look to social media, right? Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, right? Um, maybe these folks are looking at literature for prospective college students. So what kind of literature is already available from UC's electrical engineering program? Um, you know, is the content that's on that promotional material diverse in nature? Would it be attractive to a black freshman, for example? Second example is, again, black young adults voting in Cincinnati. So, you know, probably again, social media is going to be important here. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. I would imagine, you know, I know voting in general, um, a, a lot of this work happens by word of mouth. So maybe, the, maybe folks are communicating about voting in churches or at bars or coffee shops, right? So I'm gonna give you a minute to brainstorm just a little bit about how your target audiences might receive their information. Okay, so would it be billboards? Would that be an effective way to communicate a message to your target audience? Um, drawings, illustrations, maybe? Maybe they like to communicate over email? Maybe it's via text messages, right? What about like Skype or Zoom or Teams meetings? Maybe they prefer to communicate virtually. Maybe it's more of a lunch meeting type setting, right? Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, the more direct the communication, the more effective the communication is. So that could be a good strategy too. We got about 15 seconds left brainstorming how your target audiences currently receive information. Got five seconds. Okay. So that was step number four, determining how each audience currently receives information. All right, so you figured out, you know, the need that you want to respond to. You thought about who you need uh, who needs to be part of your group, who you need to bring to the table um, to help you kind of move the needle on a particular issue. You considered, you know, the information that these folks already have or the things that they already believe about um, the community need that, that you identified. And then you thought about, you know, the most successful communication uh, methods for these very various audiences. So now you should be in a good position to start creating some measurable objectives um, for each audience, right? So overall, what are your goals for your advocacy campaign? What outcomes do you hope to achieve by completing your advocacy campaign, right? Your advocacy goal should result in some sort of measurable change, okay? Keep in mind that objectives are different from outputs, right? So an objective 
is a measurable change in behavior, attitude, or disposition. An output is essentially a number of interventions or widgets, right? So let's use an example of a GED program. Maybe your advocacy goal is you really want, you know, folks who dropped out of high school um, to, to get their high school diploma because we know having a high school diploma oftentimes can be the difference between you living in extreme poverty in the United States and not. Right. And obviously, uh, racial demographics kind of intersect with this issue. So, you know, an output for a GED program, for, for example, would be to matriculate 50 students in the program. Right. That's a number of participants. That doesn't show you a measurable change in anything. Right. The real question is, OK, so out of those 50 students. Right. What percent of those folks actually passed their GED exam, right? So an objective would be um, for 80% of program participants to successfully pass their GED exams. We should also keep in mind that goals should be SMART, right? Maybe you've heard of this term before, SMART goals. Okay, SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time determined. So what do I mean when I say all these things? So your goal should be specific, right? You need to be clear on what you want to accomplish. Okay, they should be measurable. So your goals should be quantifiable somehow. Okay, it's important to measure your progress. You should have achievable goals, right? So your goal should be, you know, not too easy or too hard. You should set ambitious but realistic targets. Right? This is really a central tenet to humanitarian leadership, right? This idea that, you know, there are so many structural issues in our society uh, that, you know, it's, it can be really overwhelming, right? Like I like to tell students, you know, you're, you're not going to save the planet today, but you might be able to save someone today. So how do you, you know, reduce this big community need that you identify down to something, you know, where you can actually make an impact, okay? Your goal should be relevant, right? The goal should align with your values and your long-term objectives. And they should be time determined. So, you know, there really should be some sort of deadline for achieving your goal. So, you know, with our first example of that electrical engineering uh, need, Maybe we have the goal of increasing black enrollment in electrical engineering by 25% by 2027, right? That gives you what, five years, it's about 5% per year. To me, that seems like an achievable goal, right? It's time bound, right? It's specific, it's relevant. The second example was uh, increasing black young adults uh, in voting, right? So maybe the goal the goal is increasing black young adults voting in Cincinnati in the 2024 presidential election by 15%, right? Um, that would be quite an accomplishment. All right. So now I'm going to give you some time to brainstorm some goals related to the community need that you identified. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about that on your own. What would a realistic goal be for your advocacy campaign? So maybe you're concerned about pollution. Um, maybe you could set a goal of, you know, cleaning the um, the creek or whatever the waterway, the water system by a certain percent. Um, maybe. The opportunity is related to healthcare. Maybe you want to um, work with an existing nonprofit in their programs uh, related to reducing uh, infant mortality. So maybe your goal is, you know, to ensure um, that a certain number of moms out of their client pool have access to um, 
So uh, diapers, right? Just an idea. So hopefully you've had some time to brainstorm a measurable goal for your advocacy opportunity. So we're about halfway through our plan. So the next step is defining messages for each audience. Okay, so what messages do you think will resonate with each audience, right? Different messages are gonna work with different audiences. So um, try to connect your message to your target audience's goals and values, right? Values are things that people find to be important, right? So what do they find to be important? Okay, tailoring messages does not mean compromising arguments or goals. It means trying to see an issue from a different perspective and understanding the attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge that the message recipient utilizes when making decisions. So let's go through our two examples, right? So we had the uh, black enrollment in the electrical engineering program. So maybe a good message to communicate uh, to prospective students of color would be median wages for electrical engineers in Ohio is $86,000 a year. It's a lot more money than I make, right? Uh, that is a good industry to get into, right? The innovation used to create longer lasting light bulbs with a carbon filament came from a black, uh, black inventor named Louis Latimer. And this helped to bring electricity to the masses, right? So maybe that'd be a good uh, message to communicate to potential um, black students enrolling in the electrical engineering program. For you know, getting black young adults in Cincinnati voting, um, maybe a good reason to vote is to vote in honor of your ancestors who were once denied their constitutional right to the ballot box, right? Maybe they'd be receptive to, you know, like a bandwagon argument. So voting is cool, right? Just ask Michelle Obama, whose birthday was yesterday, or Janelle Monet, or Chris Paul, who were the co-founders of When We All Vote, which is a really cool nationwide um, voter registration campaign, right? Don't take it from me. Take it from Michelle Obama, right? So now I want you to consider... Um, to think about the various messages that you think your tar target audiences might respond to favorably uh, in order to be persuaded to join your cause. So I'll give you a minute to think about some of those messages. And again, you're trying to tailor your message to what that particular constituent values, what they find to be important, and what their goals are, right? What are they hoping to accomplish? And how can you help them to reach their goal while they help you to reach your goal? Got about 20 seconds. Give me about 10 more seconds. Okay, so you thought a little bit about messages that your audiences might respond well to. The next step is determining the communication activities that you'll use to deliver those messages. Right? So really you're coming up with a communication plan here, right? So create a communication plan based on how your target audience is preferred to communicate and your target messages. Again, keep in mind that the more direct and specific the message is, the more successful it will be. In other words, an in-person conversation is always going to be more successful and more effective than sending out an email via a listserv or you know, blasting something out on social media. Also understand that there might be some really significant barriers that will prevent you from communicating in person, right, due to the pandemic. So you might need to be a little flexible here for the time being. So let's go back to our examples. We had the black enrollment in electrical engineering example. 
right? So maybe a communication plan um, for, for that particular um, community need could include creating and implementing a social media campaign for greater Cincinnati black high school students and um, you know, their parents, right? Uh, social media campaigns are fairly easy to create. Um, might be a good idea um, if you're looking to interact with younger folks, right? Maybe you want to do in-person tabling during lunchtime at area minority serving high schools, right? In partnership with school resource coordinators and counselors. Okay, so maybe there's this in-person component. Maybe you need to work on updating and disseminating new enrollment materials for UC's electrical engineering program, focusing on programs and services for minoritized students, right? So um, thinking through, you know, different communication activities that you could do, right, in order to communicate the key messages that your, your key audiences need to hear so that they can get on board with your advocacy plan. The second example is, again, with black, black young adults in Cincinnati voting. Again, maybe you create some sort of social media campaign, right, for greater Cincinnati black young adults ages 18 to 30. Maybe you should call local black churches to ask if you could do voter registration before and after church services on Sundays. Maybe call owners of local bars that are popular with black young adults to ask if you could do voter registration tabling outside of the building hours, right? Those would all be good kind of communication strategies, right? Um, to help you reach uh, your target audiences. So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about different communication activities um, that you could pursue for your particular advocacy opportunity. Remember, try to be as direct and specific as possible, right? Um, this, this concept is really popular in fundraising, um, in the fundraising industry, right? There's this a thing called the ladder of fundraising effectiveness, right? And it's getting at the same thing. So again, this concept is, you know, having a phone call with someone or having an in-person meeting, you know, if you make an ask, you're gonna be much more effective doing that than, you know, just sending them an email or, you know, putting an ad in a newspaper, right? You might be able to reach a, lot, a larger audience that way, but I'm not sure you're, it'll be as specific and you, you probably won't get great results. So we're, th we're thinking through communication activities to deliver your key messages. Now we're on step eight, deciding what resources are necessary to complete each activity, right? So consider, you know, what will you need in order to successfully communicate your messages to your target audience? Okay. So for our black enrollment in the electrical engineering program, you would probably need access to social media accounts. You would need word processing software, money to promote messages via social media. Uh, maybe you'd need print materials. Right. For the Black young adults voting opportunity, again, you probably need access to social media accounts. You might need money to promote social media messages. You would need to print out voter registration cards, potentially. You might need to buy stamps. Right. So all these things are resources that you would need in order to successfully complete your plan. So. Um, I'm going to give you another minute to think about some resources that you could utilize, right, while you're working on your advocacy plan. So, you know, resources could be food or drinks, you know, especially if you're going to be doing some tabling on campus in the future, um, you know, food is popular. Um, maybe you need some giveaways, right, t-shirts, um, some swag of some kind. 
Maybe you need knowledge on a particular topic. Okay, maybe you need money or access to capital. Maybe you need specific social networks. Could it be software or hardware or equipment? You got about 20 more seconds. Maybe you need a translator or transportation. Or maybe it's just time and labor. Right? So what are all the things that you need in order to be successful? Maybe you should use um, the uh, handout, the toolbox that we emailed to you all for today's training, right? That could be a good resource too. So you'll need to think through all the resources that, you'll, that are needed in order to be successful, successful with your advocacy plan. Now we're at step nine. So you should establish a timeline and a responsible party for each activity, okay? So when should each activity be completed and who's responsible for completing each activity, right? You can use milestones to help you track your progress over time. So, you know, for each activity, maybe you come up with a timeline. So an example, these examples really could be for either campaign potentially, but uh, maybe you draft up content for social media campaigns by March 15th, or maybe you make 15 follow-up calls with local, local black churches by May 1st, right? What kind of timelines do you need and who is responsible for each of those activities? I'm gonna give you another minute to think to yourself about some timelines. You know, is this, is this something you can accomplish in a week, in a month, six months, a year? Or is this more of a structural opportunity? Is this going to take years to accomplish, right? Try to be realistic. Save about 10 more seconds. Brainstorming timelines, milestones. Okay. Then we get to the 10th step. So the final step of our advocacy planning. So uh, the 10th step is evaluating whether or not you've reached your, your objectives or your goals, right? So how do you know if your advocacy campaign was successful, right? Did it result in a change in the skills, knowledge, attitude, or behavior of your target audiences, right? And again, just a reminder, there's a difference between an output and an outcome, right? So, you know, maybe we go back to um, the voting issue, right? So if you um, register 50, um, young local black individuals to vote ages 18 to 30, right? That's a that's a that's an output, right? Not an outcome, right? So, you know, that's why it's important. These setting these goals at the beginning are really important, right? Because, you know, out of those 50 that you registered to vote, how many of them actually voted, right? That's how you would know if you're successful, right? So. Some other just examples of how you might know whether or not you've reached your objectives. Um, what was the, the number of social media impressions for each social media campaign? That might give you some indication of whether or not your campaign was successful. Um, did more black freshmen enroll in the program the following year? Right? Did more black young adults in Cincinnati vote in the 2024 presidential election? Right. So I'm going to have you again take another minute to brainstorm to yourself. How would you de define success for your advocacy plan?
Got about 30 seconds left. About 15 seconds left. Okay, so we just went through all of the 10 steps of advocacy planning. So now we're going to start our activity. So, you know, this, this training is part of our Dr. King um, activities uh, for this year. Dr. King sacrificed everything so that we could live in a more just world, right? So what are you going to do? to continue Dr. King's work, right? So hopefully we can live in a more inclusive place one day, right? So um, I, alone, on your own, I would like you to start brainstorming. So we're gonna get, we're gonna dive in even deeper. I'm really gonna, we're gonna start, right? Fleshing out your advocacy plan. Identify three issues, three things that you really care about, right? What keeps you up at night? Right? Um, you know, is it something related to climate change? Is it something related to structural racism, childhood poverty, college affordability, healthcare in inequality, the opioid crisis? Right? And all of these issues also intersect with structural racism, right? There's a lot of intersectionality with these issues. So I want you to brainstorm that on your own. And then but more importantly, I want you to think about the why. Why did you select these issues? Why do they keep you up at night? Do they impact you personally? Do they impact your loved ones or your neighbors or your friends? Okay. So it is 12.43. We're probably ahead of where we are in schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and give you um, a good amount of time on this project. So I'm going to uh, mute myself for this activity while you all are brainstorming your three issues that you care about and then reflecting on why you chose those issues and then we'll um, get you all we'll get into breakouts uh, and we'll do the second portion of our activity. So again, you're brainstorming issues that you really care about in life, right? What issues keep you up at night? Is it women's rights and gender equity? Is it water access? Is it vaccines and vaccine hesitancy? Is it reproductive rights, abortion, family planning, racial justice, structural racism, right? And all the issues that kind of stem into that. Is it mental health care? Is it LGBTQ plus issues? Maybe it's income inequality. Could it be hunger? Right? We've seen a dramatic increase in hunger across the United States since uh, the pandemic began. Is it college affordability? Do student loans keep you up at night? Right? 
Maybe it's healthcare access, right? Maybe it's issues related to healthcare. Okay. Is it disability rights, ableism? Right. And why did you select these issues? Is this something you experienced maybe when you were a kid? Right. Is this why you're majoring in what you're majoring today? Does this Im issue impact your friends? Right. Or maybe your family members? Right? Maybe you're concerned about how this issue might impact your children in future generations. I'm going to give you three more minutes and then we're going to move on to the to the uh, group activity. What are the issues that you really, really care about? And why do you care about those issues? Give you two more minutes to brainstorm some issues that you care about and why you select those. What issue do you think you could reduce down to a manageable size, right? So you can impact the community for the better. Well, why did you select that? You have one more minute. You wrapping up your thoughts, why you selected those issues, and then we'll be ready for our group activity. Let's wrap up those thoughts. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get into groups. So we're going to place you into um, a bunch of different small groups. And I would like you all to share out the top three issues that you care about and discuss why you chose those issues. And then I want you to maybe identify some areas of over overlap. So is there an issue that others in your group also highlighted, potentially? And then think about what could you do as an individual and as a group to move the needle on this issue? Who would you need to persuade to accomplish your goal? So if you could, please write these down because when we uh, create the breakouts, you won't be able to see the, the prompt. So again, 
Uh, you're sharing out your top three issues that you care about and discussing why they're important to you. Then you're identifying areas of overlap. Maybe there's one issue that everyone in your group highlighted. Uh, and then just spend a couple minutes brainstorming what you could do as an individual and as a group to move the needle on this issue. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to get you all in a couple breakouts. So I'm gonna, we're going to put you in these groups. You'll have about 10 minutes for this activity. And then um, we'll come back and do a share out. So everyone should have been invited to a breakout room.
All right, looks like everyone's coming back. Excellent. Y'all, a couple more moments to return. Welcome back. Welcome and while back. we're returning, because um, I know Keith is, is also doing that, but while we're returning, um, I would ask that for your group, please share what you've, what you've talked about when it comes to different issues that are impacting you. And we can start working through these. Um, so many things I've heard in our group particularly was about recruitment, recruitment, equity. And when you're thinking about like retaining people, you kind of got to get down to, okay, well, how are we going to retain them? There's issues um, in our whole entire institution embedded where we're working at and embedded in where we're trying to develop these, these students and even ourselves. So I would love to hear some of the engaging conversations that you've had. And maybe even if you haven't gotten to an action plan, giving us that conversation so we can also engage with you to make a uh, make an action plan would be something I think will be really remarkable. So um, anybody who, who does want to chime in, Please, you know, put your uh, use your your act reaction button or even unmute yourselves, um, and then we will start having an engaging conversation with you. Um, our group didn't really get to discussing overlap much, but I did notice we mentioned a variety of issues, and a lot of it was like what we are particularly passionate about was shaped by a personal experience as well, just in the sense of that obviously everything that was mentioned is something that we think is worth caring about, but the things in which you want to devote your time to a lot of times will be something that affect you a lot more personally. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned uh, casteism because I'm from India, so that's something that feels a lot closer to me. Um, people mentioned, um, someone was working in the health field and mentioned health disparities. We talked about uh, racism and it really struck me that even though a lot of these topics are very wide, like we talked about everything from climate change to prison rights, but it's interesting to see that these things are interconnected at the end of the day. Just hearing people describe it, it's like, okay, the way that issue is being described, it's like that issue leads to this issue, this issue leads to that issue. And, it's, and I think that's something that's really interesting because even if you're just focusing on one thing, if you improve that uh, that situation there, or if you try and fix that problem a bit, you end up helping other areas as well. If not directly, then at least indirectly, because it's it's never just one issue. It's always like a bunch of them that's interlinked. Yeah, yeah, it's a spider web, honestly. Um, like, where's the first thing that you're going to tug at in order to unravel what what this the suppression is or any kind of disparity? And honestly, um, I think it's the first thing that. Brittany was talking about, that's one of the foundations when you're thinking about any critical theories in general, not just critical race, but any theories in general. What's the, re what's the reason why we are actually coming here for the problem? Like, what is the problem? And we have to expand upon that, the historical problems. What is the history behind everything we're doing? Um, and how can we as people who are trying to um, liberate the, uh, the world, like how do we start? Where's our first beginning? So I would love to hear more about that. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else? I know you all had some good conversations. What, what, what else did we talk about in your small groups? What really sticks out to you? I'll hop in here. So our group, um, we have the opportunity to speak about um, all of our top three. And one of the things that uh, was resounding across the board was just our draw towards the criminal justice system. Um, though each of us had a different aspect in which we were passionate about, whether that was at the front end and in terms of like the prison to or the pipeline system, um, or more so responding to after someone is already in there, how do you help them reintegrate into society um, as a whole citizen? So, but, so we each had our different kind of uh, entry point into wanting to address some sort of systematic issue within the system, but um, it was definitely an umbrella in, across our group. And 
because we had different ideas around what we were kind of passionate about hoping to fix, that then influenced some of the other strategies that we felt like as an individual, even as a collective, we could employ. So um, for those who were more so focused on like sentencing guidelines and ensuring equity in the system, um, highlighted how the importance of voting uh, plays into this as an intervention to say if we're putting in judges, prosecutors, et cetera, um, being intentional about who those people are and being mindful that the people could influence the, the system and the process. Um, and then uh, some of us who had family members who were uh, have been impacted by this system, took a more individualistic approach to say, hey, if we can't change the whole thing, let's just focus in on what can we do to meet their immediate needs. So um, like helping people get jobs or um, amplifying other programs that already exist uh, that are helping to remedy these scenarios. Yeah, and I love the fact that you said we can't um, tackle everything. That's one of the things that um, Keith will talk about when it comes to racial fatigue. But I don't know if anybody else this summer, but I've been exhausted when it comes to the news, when it comes to thinking about the racial um, issues that are happening, when it comes to also thinking about my position as an advocate. Because that means that not only am I taking care of the issues outside, I got to take care of myself too. And honestly, somebody's going to get squeezed out. I don't know which one, it'll probably be me. But with that said, um, what is the revolution? Is the revolution um, basically something that we all have to always partake in? When do we get rest? Um, so it's really interesting that you say that because really the biggest part about being an advocate is knowing how to also advocate for your own personal peace. You know, so that we're also able to be energized to fight for the causes that really are important to us. So thank you so much for, for adding that. That's amazing. Anybody else? Okay. I, I, we're, we're almost there, I promise you. I know so much information we're throwing at you, but I, I really do appreciate you, you staying with us um, throughout this. So Keith, we'll go ahead and turn it back to you. Talk about racial trauma, particularly. Absolutely. So <clears throat> really your homework from here is to start working on your advocacy plan. And so, you know, we gave you the resource over email. Uh, it includes the 10 steps of ad advocacy planning. We encourage you to use that resource. Um, but, you know, you're more than welcome to reach out to any of us as well. Uh, and we'd be happy to work with you on helping uh, your advocacy plan come to life. So before we start talking about um, self-care, right, I do want to provide an opportunity um, for anyone who might have a question about advocacy planning to ask questions. Um, what kind of questions do you all have about advocacy pl uh, planning? Hi, um, this is Zoe. One question I have is, um, is there, or do y'all have, or can access um, like a decent list of organizations already working in advocacy roles within the Cincinnati metro area? Because I know some things um, it's better rather than to start your own thing is to help like a already existing organization. I love that you asked that. So my first uh, gut reaction is to send you to volunteer.uc.edu. Um, there you can find um, hundreds of community partners that we work with um, out of the Center for Community Engagement. And so we have opportunities in there related to every single one of these cause areas that we talked about. So that would be my first um, step for you is to go to volunteer.uc.edu and to search through um, the various nonprofits that we have in there. Uh, outside of that, I don't have like a specific list of uh, nonprofits to do advocacy with, but um, you know that's something we could definitely work on. But I think this, uh, our database in, in volunteer.uc.edu will probably be the best uh, fit for you. Any other thoughts from the rest of you? 
Did I leave anything out? Or from other folks in the chat, other ideas on how to kind of find um, advocacy opportunities that already exist? CincinnatiCares.org is a great resource. Yeah, so they collect volunteer needs uh, in, in our region and post them there so you can find some opportunities to get involved. The um, United Way, the local United Way affiliate has a similar website. Um, so those are two other additional resources. Okay, I, there's a question in the chat. Is the advocacy plan something that you recommend using with students in the classroom, specifically in a service learning type course? Yeah, absolutely. You could you can use this, you know, to think through any form of plan where you want to give back to society. So, you know, if you're working on a service learning project in your classroom, I love it. I think this plan, this structure would really help you to go through kind of a thorough uh, planning process. And I think that will really help you to uh, achieve your outcomes in the community even better. I would also like to add, um particularly when you're thinking about advocacy plan within the classroom. The first thing we really do try to do as educators is to make a democratic society so that everybody feels like they have a part within the problem, able to solve the problem, but able to also be heard. So I think one of the biggest things with advocacy planning for students is making sure that they realize that they have the power to do something, taking the information they're they, they, they are gaining, but also think about it critically so that they're able to process that issue. Um, but also once they do that, feel empowered. There is no such thing as a mistake for being an advocate. There is no such thing as a more important issue. It really just depends on what leads you. So giving that space is really one of the most important things when it comes to our students, so that students realize that they have a very active role. You don't have to wait until graduation. You are already a developing leader. So take that particular empowerment or take that power and do something. That means either researching right there with your group to see what exactly can um, you can go to to join at UC or even in Cincinnati. But that also means talking and spreading actual truthful information on social media. That's one of the biggest things that we have to do as advocates, make sure that we are giving accurate information at all times. Fantastic question. Any other questions before we um, go to our next segment? All right, okay, let's go to our next segment. So now we're going to talk about racial fatigue and rest during resistance. So um, what, what do we mean when we say racial trauma? So racial trauma describes the physical and emotional symptoms that people of color often experience after exposure, exposure to particularly stressful experiences of racism, right? Racial trauma is a cumulative experience where every personal or vicarious encounter with racism contributes to a more insidious chronic stress, right? Which is why self-care is so important when you're working on advocacy because um, we want you to have, you know, healthy mental health uh, and we don't want you to get burnt out, right? So what are some typical signs of racial trauma? So some common signs and symptoms of racial trauma include re-experiencing. So thoughts and feelings might pop into one's mind. Uh, could be reliving what happened, right? It feels like it's happening all over again. Maybe you feel overwhelmed when you're reminded of, um, you know, what happened to you. Maybe it's increased anxiety, right? Um, anxiety is kind of fearing about what could happen in the future. So, you know, symptoms could be always being afraid that something bad will happen, right? Maybe you're more easily startled or you're jumpy. Maybe you have trouble with sleep or concentration and you might go into fight or flight mode, right? Typical uh, anxiety responses. Maybe you'll engage in avoidance, 
right? Maybe you try to block it out uh, to not think about it, or maybe you try to stay away from reminders, or maybe you just feel numb or you don't have any emotions at all, right? Disassociation. So maybe things feel unreal, like you're living in a dream. And maybe you have trouble remembering parts of what happened to you. You might feel freaked out, disorganized, right? Your behavior is no longer predictable or regulated. And there's some other possible signs. Maybe increased sleep, trouble sleeping, uh, increased or loss of appetite, a sense of sadness and or hopelessness, isolation or withdrawal from others, alcohol or drug abuse to cope, anger, maybe you have heightened irritability with others or increased body aches and pains, headaches and muscle fatigue. Okay, let's see, Sorelia, anyone else? Did I leave any other signs of racial trauma that you think would be important to talk about? To be honest, um, we, we outlined these, but remember anxiety looks different for everybody. Um, one of the things that I realized when I, I realized that I was, I was um, traumatized, particularly by the different things that are happening around us. Um, I have said over and over again, this can't be real. This can't be real, this can't be real because I am anxious, you know, and I have lost complete control. And that's usually the kind of person I am. My mom jokes that I am a triple A type person. And you can imagine if you are a type A person that this is very, very scary for us because we don't know what's happening next. Um, but I think that the sign of racial trauma really is um, uh, everything that we put on here, but also just realizing when you yourselves are no longer um, the best you can be, when you have um, slept more, when you don't feel like eating, you're, the, the things that give you joy um, no longer give you joy, that's when you have to kind of reassess like what's giving me this particular um, response. And for me, um, I can admit that it is racial trauma. So. Um, please, please, if you do see somebody who is going back and forth with different things that are happening in news, always remember this. Racial fatigue and racial trauma is something that really is impacting the people of color. Um, and also people who are from um, uh, minority um, communities in general um, today. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about just ways that you can practice self-care. And then after this, we're going to practice some self-care. So some uh, typical ways that you might be able to cope with racial trauma could include self-monitoring for signs of stress and trauma, okay? Know that, um, you know, the signs um, that you experience right now means that you're feeling stressed, right? And be open to feedback from others who might notice um, some of those signs. Restore the well that is in you. Relax, rest, Engage in energizing activities. Let others replenish the well. Ask for help. Seek nurturing from those who love and understand you. Right? Stay spiritually grounded. Prayer, mindfulness, right? All these things connect. Um, you know, we just recommend that you try to connect with whatever your higher power may be to make you spiritually grounded. Remember your body, relax, meditate, exercise, eat well, sleep, and breathe. Avoid or minimize use of tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and caffeine. Stay informed, but monitor how often. Unplug. Avoid reading the comments sections after online articles or blog posts, right? Limit your exposure to triggers. Be intentionally kind and gentle with yourself and those around you. Laugh, practice random acts of kindness, and speak positively to yourself and to others. Okay. Any other positive self-care ideas that you all have? All right. Maybe. So, yeah, go ahead. Maybe use some of 
the recommendations from uh, stress management? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think any of those, you know, activities that you would use to deal with stress might be good for this. I love that. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to practice some mindfulness and we're going to do this together. So I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Feel free to turn your camera on or not. Okay. I'm going to leave mine on. Okay. And I'm going to run you through uh, a meditation activity so you can see what I'm doing with my body. So um, there's all kinds of research right, that meditate, practicing meditating and practicing power posing can significantly reduce the level of cortisol in your blood, right? Cortisol is your stress hormone, right? So when you feel really stressed out, it's because you have a high level of cortisol running through your blood, right? Uh, so, you know, my recommendation for you is when you're feeling those feelings of stress and anxiety, you need to take a break, right, and practice some meditation, Okay, so um, I like to practice body posing while I meditate. You don't have to if you don't want to, but I'm going to show you how to do it if you do. Okay, so when I say power posing, really what I'm getting at is, you know, what you do with your body physically impacts your mental health, right? So, you know, if you get up and you get in a power pose like Superman, like this, right, this power pose is going to significantly reduce the cortisol level in your blood, right? Another power pose would be you kind of leaning over a table, right? You have your hands uh, held down on the table, your feet are flat in front of you, right? And you're kind of um, bearing over the table a little bit. That's a power pose, right? The opposite of a power pose would be kind of slouching over, touching your neck, right? When you touch your neck, your cortisol level is going to go up, up, up. It's a natural response that all humans have, right? Um, if you kind of, you know, are curled up like this, you know, your body is going to influence your mind and you're going to feel more anxious, right? So that's, that's the great thing about power posing is it really opens up your body, it projects strength, right? And it can really help to reduce that cortisol level. So I'm going to power pose while I practice meditating. You don't have to. You can just practice meditating with me, okay? Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to take two minutes, okay? And we're going to practice meditating together. All right. So, um, you know, what I want you to do is if you want to get your power pose, great, do it. Okay. I'm in my Superman pose. Okay, now I'm going to um, turn on my clock. And we're gonna spend two minutes breathing in deeply for four seconds, and then two, and then, or excuse me, and then four seconds breathing very slowly out. All right, are you with me? Got your power pose ready? All right, let's start. So we're breathing in for four seconds, slowly and deeply. Great, now breathe out slowly and deeply for four seconds. Breathing in. Great, breathing out. Okay, let's do it over again. And out. In. And out. Good job, in. And out. I like to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. In my nose, out my mouth. In and out. Okay. In and out. Keep it up. You're doing great. In and out. In. And out. In. And out. Got about 30 seconds left. In. And out. In. 
and out. In your nose, out your mouth, in, and out. Okay, you just spent two minutes meditating and power posing. Okay, how do y'all feel? Do you feel like your cortisol level is lower? Do you feel a little bit more calm and rested, right? Yes, feel better. Good. See someone in the comments said they're a big fan of power posing. I love it. Yep, maybe you have your favorite power pose. Maybe it's sometimes it's like this. Maybe it's this, right? All kinds of ways to power pose. So we need to be practicing mindfulness and meditation while we're doing this work, okay? Maybe it's once a day before you go to bed. Maybe it's, you know, as soon as you wake up. Um, but I want you to start building in meditation into your advocacy practice. All right. Great. So um, the next thing that we want to do is we want to provide you all an opportunity to give us some feedback. So how can the University of Cincinnati, how can we as faculty and staff advocate for you, right, as you work on your advocacy during this really stressful time that we're all living in? So, um, you know, this can be anything. So we're just brainstorming ways that you see faculty and staff can be helpful for our students to help them be even better advocates. What are some thoughts that you all have? Feel free to type ideas in the chat or unmute yourself. How can we help you in your advocacy journey? What kind of resources do you need from us? Trainings like this are supportive. Love it. What else? Are there any um, training topics in particular that you think would be helpful? Um, to make you an uh, even better advocate? Amy says she wishes uh, we had an official midday break. I have so many meetings that happen at the lunch hour, it makes it hard to take a break. Okay, so maybe have some trainings and meetings not during lunchtime. So you have a little bit of a breather for yourself. That makes sense. Other ways we as faculty and staff can support you in your advocacy work. Other thoughts, ideas? I think faculty and staff can advocate for more diversity among professors and higher up positions in the university. Love that. More explicit support for graduate students. We act as both students and instructors, and it often feels that we are forgotten by both groups. Some feel forgotten. Also wanted to let folks know that the Office of Research paid to send faculty to the BOLD program through the Leadership Council would be great to continue this and include students and staff. Okay, so um, we need more faculty and staff attend um, leadership. 
chip programs like the one called the leadership council. So this is the bold training. DEI certificate programs for students, faculty, staff. Love it. Love it, love it. Other ideas? Great. Other ways? DEI town halls? Great. What else? Other ways faculty and staff can help students or other faculty and staff uh, as they navigate their advocacy. More consistent places like this. Okay. Let's see, continual training and resources available year round. Today's training has been awesome, but at its conclusion, how do we keep the momentum going? At the least, I would like to see quarterly trainings if possible for those interested. Great. Similar to what we had before, so I'm gonna put that here. Of it. Other ideas. How can we support you to be better advocates? Feel free to unmute yourself or type your idea into the chat. All right, any other last thoughts before we wrap things up for today? All right. So let's see. Sorelia, am I handing this one off to you or does this go to Eric? Well, we're handing it over to Eric now. Perfect. Eric, are you there with us? I'm here. Hold on. <laughs> this gets sticky. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to our presenters, Keith, uh, Brittany, and Surya. And thanks to Dr. Evans for making yourself available for uh, the program today. <clears throat> and thanks for a VP merchant uh, who actually. Uh, provided a webinar uh, that had caused the MOK, uh, commission, uh, MOK committee to reimagine re MOK. So thank you for uh, providing that for us. And so I'd like to leave you with a profound statement, <coughs> excuse me, from Audrey Lord. She's a civil rights activist and poet, just to name a few of her social roles. She dedicates her life to, uh, and her creative talent to confronting and addressing uh, injustices. And it says, there is no such thing as single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Back to you, Sharia. All right, fantastic. Now, again, thank you all so much. Um, Eric will be putting in, we'll also be sending out a, sur a, a survey soon, but we'll also be putting a link to the survey in our chat. Um, we really do value your feedback. We want to get better. So please, please, please um, fill out that survey. And again, thank you so much for giving us your time and your attention and your leadership is always uh, valuable to us. Thank you again.